Welcome morning, everybody. Here's a plan for today. We're going to start off by talking about some of the near-term changes in the pattern, which are kind of finally coming together after a couple of weeks of discussion here. I've got a high wind event coming into parts of Montana later today, maybe some wind gusts getting up there around 80 miles an hour. We're also going to talk about the heat that's building into the west and the resulting pattern across the rest of the country. Once we get through that, we're going to shift a bit more into just trying to understand how long uh, the this pattern shift is going to be around. I think it's going to be temporary. I don't think it lasts more than six, seven, eight days. And then we'll talk about where we think things might be going uh, a bit later in the month of June. But then the last bit of um, uh, tabs I have here, all of these, this is all about Russia. I want to have a discussion about that and think about 2010. That's a year that uh, I just want to spend a little bit more time in. So this is what we're going to do today. And the map you've been watching for a while here is showing you water vapor, upper level water vapor in the atmosphere. It's a tracer of the flow of the atmosphere. And so this is satellite viewed. And what's changed is a couple of things. One, this low here. Most of the last, I mean, several weeks, this low has been sitting just north of Hawaii, about right here. And what's also changed is this. We've seen this flow much farther to the north for quite some time, and we're dipping a trough into this area, one where there's been ridging over the last several weeks, in fact, months. And so it's a shift. And what it's done is it's driven over the last you know, 24 hours or so a pretty sizable you know, river of moisture into the western United States, adding rain to the west. Normally, as we get into this point in June, we're relatively dry throughout the entirety of the western United States. Uh, and at the same time, out ahead of that, we've still continued to watch ex you know, a lot of storms. For example, watch the storms explode here late in the animation after last night's convection through the southern plains getting into the south. And there were also some pretty nasty storms that rolled through parts of uh, southern Wisconsin, Illinois. So the Storm Prediction Center really did a great job on finding those particular storms. I didn't want to give you yesterday's storm reports. Just quickly here, added another 102 reports overall. You can kind of get an idea on where they were. And this is uh, what I've got now for the last three days of hail. So we had some big hail that came out of a storm last night in parts of South Dakota. It just kind of shows up here on this, uh, on this map as well. So where are we this morning? Again, I'm working on some new images for you, and I like long animations. It helps me see things. And so this is kind of my uh, US composite. You'll be able to just grab this and slide it along and see whatever you want. Plus, I have this all for different regions. I can't wait to release this to you. It's going to be a lot of fun. But if we just click play and just watch how this has evolved, this is the nose of that extended flow of moisture that came into the Northwest. And it's curling up here in and throughout the Canadian prairie, which has this spring, for the most part, seen quite a bit of precipitation almost too much in some areas, really delaying the, the spring progress with a lot of field work and planting. As the animation nears its very end, though, we can watch the storms this morning that were pretty strong right in through here, coming out of Oklahoma, right along the northern side of the Red River, right as this resets here. We have a pretty nasty squall line rolling through that area this morning. But if we look back over the last 72 hours and just kind of add up the total precip here, let's shrink that up so you can see a bit better. There you go. This is what we've got. And it looks a lot like the continuation of a pattern we've been in for a while. But as we know, things are beginning to, to shift. And this big push of moisture that just came into the northwest and is rolling into this low that's going into the Canadian prairie, the constant storms that have been across parts of the south, mid-south, central U.S., midwest, you know, this region, we're about to just get a bit of a change in all of that. So where do we stand today? Well, we've got the excessive heat watches and warnings that have lined you know, through parts of Arizona, Nevada, and California. We've got the heat advisories, the heat watches that are down here into Texas, plus the flood warnings that are out ahead of this in a large area flood watch. Strong wind event. We're going to have to take a close look at this as this flow comes over the top of the Cascades, which is why we have the flood watch here, and then over the top of the Northern Rockies, and we get this downslope flood event that's going to be pretty rough uh, in this area later on today. Out ahead of this, a couple of areas of fog. We do have flood watches that are in northern Wisconsin and this part of, um, of Minnesota as well. But just take a look at what the flow is going to look like by midday today. So here it is. This is the deep low that is just sitting off the coast, and you, you can just get a sense of the flow that's coming through here. And it's hitting the mountains perpendicularly. So we get this downslope flow over the top of them, and as it does so, it accelerates down the, you know, the, the east-facing slopes, and uh, we end up getting winds that could be 50 to 80 miles an hour in parts of Montana. But it's been more about the bigger change in the pattern that we're going to be discussing. And by the time we just get into tomorrow on the 5th, we're already seeing something we've not seen in a while, and that is this deep trough that is living in this area. We've seen repeated ridges here pushing that trough closer to this part of uh, the North Pacific, which has driven it into the western United States. We don't have that now. 
We've built it up into a ridge that comes into British Columbia and it dives right into this part of the Midwest. We end up getting this kind of high over low look that slows the whole pattern down, gets it moving more north south than west to east. And so we're just questioning how long does something like this uh, last? So there's a couple different ways by which we can diagnose this. And I'll just show you one of our indexes. We've seen this many times over the years I've been doing these videos, but sometimes the indexes kind of give us a better clue than just watching the maps and the colors. It's kind of like watching the stock market. Sometimes I just want to see the index to determine whether or not I think there's going to be a change in my portfolio or not, right? So this one's called the PNA. We've discussed it many times, but here's the idea. When the PNA values are high, there is some side, some sort of North American West Coast ridging. Okay, and so we've been here, and we can see the PNA is going to reach a peak at some point. What time is that? You know, down here, and maybe hard for you all to see, but you know, this is like the eighth and ninth, and then after that, the PNA kind of collapses in the European model and in other models as well. And ends up coming back, I think, with a more normal look to it. In other words, no distinctive, persistent, massive ridges across the West. But also, it doesn't seem as though there's a high probability that we just dive into deep troughs once again. And so, now I know that once we get out here, the spread is large in the models. And, and that's okay, it always is. But the point is just to say that we don't see this. And that's what I would be worrying about. That That is 2021 on repeat if it would have just stayed there and never broken back down. So technically, even though I have used the term blocking with this, it's not fully a blocking pattern. It would need to be around for at least 7 to 10 days for it to be considered by definition you know, a block. But it's going to slow things down for a little bit and give us a different look at this overall pattern. So here we go. This, oops, I was a little bit heavy here. Let's come back. This is how things are going to look by this afternoon. And this is the trough that because of how much north to south flow we have on the back side, that piece of it's going to go east, but most of the back side of this is going to drop this trough farther in. So watch as we go from Tuesday into Wednesday and Thursday. There it is. So did you notice that the, the, on the back side of this, the flow is trying to move it more to the south than to the east? And that's what allows this ridge to build in for a little bit. And usually as a ridge builds into the west, just because of the typical wavelength of a Rossby wave, that's what we call these. We named them after Carl Gustav Rossby. Um, we, we've learned that we'll have to get a trough somewhere here, and it'll probably live over the Great Lakes for a few days. Uh, the good news is, is this is not getting, like I said, stuck for a long period of time. Because if it does, that drives a lot of cooler air into the Great Lakes and leaves it there. And you get cloud cover and you get persistent, annoying rains out of that. And that could be problematic for all of the, 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 the valuable cropland that's in this part of the world as well. So this is by Friday, getting into the weekend. There's Saturday and Sunday. And what we start to notice is, you know, a couple things begin to shift around. You know, our broader trough is still sitting here, but the ridge has actually kind of got a little bit of a wiggle in it. And it opened up more here into kind of the, the front range of the Rocky Mountains or even to the Great Plains. So it's already starting to show signs of collapsing by the time we get to the ninth. As we play it here to the 10th and 11th and 12th, you know, that that's back to more zonal flow. That's more flow out of the West. And that's great. I, I don't want to see this pattern getting stuck at all. Keep it open and flowing. And that's what we see the models doing here. So this is kind of fitting into my personal narrative of what I want. But we just have to understand if it's actually there in reality. So as we work our way toward the middle of the month, we have more broad troughing that comes back into the Canadian prairie. That's going to break the heat down, the excessive heat down in the west. And we're going to get storms on the southern side of this at some point once we get out there past mid-month. And so we'll probably start to see the week two model runs showing you know better moisture coming into this area. And by the way, this is the type of pattern that overall it's open to delivering moisture at places. It'll probably be a bit farther to the south initially, but um, you know we won't starve the country for moisture overall with this particular pattern. So as I played on out there, I'm getting, we're looking at the European artificial intelligence. That, that, I, I don't see any massive blocking features setting up once we kind of ditch that, the bigger ridge that's in the west. So looking at all of that, let's kind of just walk through a couple of things. Uh, I want to be careful here. Sometimes when these maps are viewed, we see anything that's green as super wet and anything that is in you know these drier looking colors on my color bar here, we think as just bone dry. 
And that's just not, not the case. These are anomalies. So what I've done here is using the European, what's called the ERA-5 reanalysis data set, I've created um, a daily average precipitation map based on information I've got from 1991 to 2020. And so there is an average daily amount of precipitation. What we do is we take the models and just compare it to that. So when you see that over a seven-day stretch that there's drier in here, it's just that it's drier, not dry in the model. So where do we have the wetter conditions? Uh, right in through this part coming out of the southern plains to the mid-south. Maybe better storms coming up against you know some of the, the, the drier high plains here of Colorado, New Mexico, and Texas. We see a wetter corridor that kind of sits from you know parts of the Canadian prairie, but getting through Ontario, the Great Lakes, and into New England. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to lop off the next four days and show you the following seven. Does that make sense? We're doing a day four through day 10. That'd be the 8th of June through the 14th. And as we look at it now, we see the effect of this, you know, the, the ridge that's building in, giving flow that comes like this. Why there are still storms lingering in this area? Well, there are a couple little shorties that wiggle underneath it. But the broader trough that lives in this area, okay, it's going to leave a front here. And we're just going to have better chances along that front to get storms. What I'm really interested in is how much rain we can put into Florida, given how incredibly dry parts of Florida have been. And then also to see what we can bring back up here into the, you know, the high plains of Texas and Oklahoma, Kansas, Colorado, and New Mexico. All right, now let's just go fully into week two. And remember, I'm going to switch here. I was using the operational model for the first two maps, which the European operational run only goes out 10 days. So if I want to look fully at week two, I need to use the ensemble. It's a lower resolution model, but I'm, we're running it 51 times. I'm averaging all 51 runs and then comparing them to that same data set I mentioned a moment ago. So you still notice we're a bit drier getting out here toward the middle of the month. But as I stated, it's not bone dry. There is still moisture in this system and there will be precipitation during this time frame. Take note though of this. That's a pretty sizable change after what's been, if you saw the video yesterday, extremely dry conditions down into parts of Florida and along parts of the East Coast. So that's what this temporary through mid-month type pattern shift is going to, to do. All right, let's now get back into the near term. Today's storm prediction center convective outlook map. We got two large areas of slight risk, one in Minnesota, Iowa, getting back into Missouri, Kansas, and Nebraska. And then running along the Red River of the South into Arkansas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. A couple of different areas to keep an eye on. And you've already seen that we had storms rolling through this here early this morning as I was recording. But take note that when this pattern becomes established, our risk of having day after day after day of severe weather begins to back off. So on the 5th, as the heat pours into the west and the flow comes around at a different angle, we just see an area here that kind of extends up toward Lake Erie that has the risk of strong storms. And then once we get into the 6th, we just have a few areas we're going to watch for general thunderstorm activity. Now, until that fully becomes established, we still have storms in the pattern. And this morning, I just have to take note here, I do not think that the NAM was well initialized. So if you take a look at 6 a.m., look right here. And let's just go back. Where did I put it? <clears throat> we had this morning at 6 a.m. storms rolling through this area. So this is going to be an issue. The, where was that tab? <laughs> the NAM model has not been well initialized. It does not have these storms in it. And this will be a problem throughout all of summer. Um, these models perform much better when the dynamical forcing is strong. In other words, there's big temperature contrast, precipitation aligns with fronts and around low pressure systems, and it's driven by big synoptic scale features. Summer thunderstorm on outflow, nope, it's, these models really struggle with that. So what we generally see as we play through tonight is the front, much clearer definition on where we could expect to see those stronger storms. See them here? But isolated and potential for some stronger storms all throughout this region as well. As we then play into the day tomorrow on Wednesday, this is early morning Wednesday, the models are attempting tonight. Remember, this was an area that the Storm Prediction Center was watching again tonight, has the risk of another round of, of strong storms, probably more linear in their convective mode than supercellular. But as we play this out there toward Wednesday, that's when we get the pattern into its new look. So the ridge begins to build. The trough of low pressure that was here is now sinking over the Great Lakes. There's the frontal boundary around it, and we'll probably be in that kind of phase for a while. 
So if we have a look, that's what you're now seeing in the new artificial intelligence forecast for the next seven days. So the low sitting here, and there's that boundary we're just going to have to keep an eye on. Now remember, some of this rain's coming tonight, but that's the boundary we're going to keep an eye on. Here is the national blend of models. See how things are starting to break up in this area. After weeks of solid, you know, one to two inches in this region, we're now seeing it back off, but there's that front. We then take a look at the, uh, in, uh, excuse me, the WPC forecast. Very similar overall. This is the newest European model. I see the same patterns in this, and this is the new GFS. I do want to note that if you look at the difference between the European model and the GFS out there a week, take note of how much wetter the GFS is farther to the south here versus the European bringing more of that moisture, especially later into Florida. You can also take a look at all the other regions if you want to pause the video and just have a look at the differences between those two models. But I'd like to show you them by just comparing them side by side. GFS left European right. As we play through today into tomorrow, getting into Thursday and Friday. So there's our low curling up late this week over the Great Lakes. And there's a front right in through here. So watch what happens along that front as we get into Saturday. You see this? There's these chance for storms to come through this corridor into the weekend around this broader low. And as we work our way out there until Sunday and Monday, see how that front still sits? By the time we get to Sunday night and Monday morning, there's actually a weak trough that tries to come over the Rocky Mountains, initiating storms that kind of line up right here. But again, the broader upper level low, pesky sitting here. You can see the showers that are associated with it. We do not want this thing to stick around for very long. And what happens is by the time we get to the 11th, 12th, and 13th, the large ridge that was over the west begins to break down. And we're just going to get ourselves into a little bit of a different look as we press toward the middle of the month. Now, if you look at the week two forecasts, they all kind of have the similar idea. You can see the better chances for rain in through here. It's in all three models. We're drier coming over the top because most of that week two is still where we're dealing with this same kind of flow idea but I think it'll be kind of repositioning after that point in the middle of the month. And if it doesn't, it'll be because the block I anticipated breaking down did not break down the way the models had suggested. And we'll, we'll look to see if something like that could happen. Uh, but remember, it, this is just the chance of being below normal. This is just models comparison to average. So I wouldn't look at this and assume bone dry for the next two weeks. It's gonna be drier in places. Some places will miss out on precip, but this is not the kind of scary move toward major drought that we'd have to worry about. Okay, from here, let's go have a look at temperatures. I'm about ready to stop showing you these frost maps because I think we're kind of clear of the major risk of frost, uh, except at high elevation, which is what you've got here. But let's dig on into these high temperatures. So already today, we're going to be seeing temperatures crack probably 100 degrees in most of California's Central Valley. We've been there for a while in southern Texas, and that, of course, extends into Mexico. By Wednesday, that's our first really hot day here in California's Central Valley. Getting into Thursday, the backside of that low, giving us the cold front that sneaks through here, dropping temperatures. But to be honest, I mean, we're dropping temperatures down into the 60s and 70s in the upper Midwest, but 70s and 80s in through here, which is technically cooler than average for early June. Meanwhile, 110, 115 degrees in California's Central Valley in some places. This would be Friday, getting into Saturday, and Sunday. We already see that by Monday, we've backed off some of the excessive heat out in the West. So that's again, after we peak the ridge over the Western United States. Over the next seven days, this is what I've got in terms of total accumulated GDDs based off of uh, the corn formula. So a base of 50, a max of 86. And if we take a look at the day five through 10, where we're still mostly in that same pattern versus the day 10 through 15, the GFS is the most aggressive on kind of breaking this down, opening that ridge up into the middle part of the country while the trough exits the southeast. European model is a bit slower on it. That's day 5 through 10 in the European, and this is day 10 through 15. We still see the shift, but the European model is a bit slower, uh, kind of allowing that warmth to linger in the west longer. And that's one of the big things about the European model I'm concerned about. So if we just stretch this out from mid-June to mid-July and just look purely at model data, um, that's, that's all this is, is that we notice that the European model is drier. Again, not dry, but drier in the central U.S. and then drier here in the northern Rockies, maybe even drier in parts of the southern Canadian prairie. One of the reasons for this is that during that time frame, 
the kind of ridge that's been in Mexico is trying to open up and have a ridge axis that kind of comes in something like this. In other words, it's going to be on the eastern side of the Rocky Mountains rather than along the continental divide. And again, this is just in the model. But as that happens, notice it's drawing in some moisture into Mexico with it, which will be critical to understand if this occurs, what it does to the Mexico drought. But as I've been showing you for the last you know, several weeks, what it does in terms of the temperature pattern uh, is this. So here's the next seven days. This is early into next week. By the time we get to mid-June, see it starting to pull that heat in by the end of june it leaves it in the central u.s and then kind of keeps it there all the way through the beginning of july and that's something we're going to have to watch carefully do we really see central u.s ridging because the larger that ridge becomes if it is truly going to show up there which again you've probably learned from me over the last six eight weeks we're not trusting these models fully out this far but if that does occur where will the ridge riding storms be how will they come up into canada how far back to the west will they make it under this uh, particular scenario where is the drought line going to be with this so keeping all of that in the back of our minds knowing that the models are tending to go toward this and they've been consistent toward it i just want to remind you that this is not what the current cpc forecast looks like just as a quick reminder i'll pull that up cpc uh, this was their june outlook all right, so different scenario based upon, um, I think, the front couple of weeks here, more heavily weighted in their forecast. So what I want to do now is I want to transition a bit, and I want to talk about another part of the world that I think is going to have to really be given more attention. So I'm going to go to the um, FAS website from the USDA. And I don't know if you know this, but you can pull up production maps for any country in this. So here's Russia's production maps, and you can just kind of hover over them and look at them. And I just picked a couple to have a good look at. I picked their corn production map. So you notice that a lot of it is in these northern Caucasus here, which is just north of Georgia. There's the Black Sea. Ukraine is here. There's the southern Russian production area, which is here, which is their biggest for some crops. Uh, and there's the central. And I also pulled up uh, wheat. And it's a little different view here because they grow more wheat farther to the east. But again, that southern region here um, grows quite a bit of it. Now, if we look and specifically focus on this area, over the last uh, 60 days, they've built up a pretty sizable deficit in precipitation, a uh, little bit more than half of normal as they've gone through their spring time frame. And I also pulled up some NDVI data and selected kind of this entire region, including the Northern Caucasus and that Southern Russian area. And it's important to note that the NDVI values lately have started to really tank off. And if you remove where it's been a bit weather, wetter, excuse me, the, the Northern Caucasus here, which I do understand that's south of the Southern, but that's just what they named it. If you remove these, the NDVI values in this area, just to the uh, east of Ukraine, our new record low for the last 20 years. So thinking this through, over the next 10 days, uh, we'd notice that the models continue to paint that same very productive region dry. And just so you understand, this area that I'm circling, kind of compared to other spots on the globe, I mean, it's, it's the size of the primary corn and soybean belt in the US, right? So this is a big area of, of growing that we're talking about. And we noticed that the models continue to put a lot of heat into that area. So if we do get storms, there's going to be a lot of evaporation that follows this. What's got me concerned is that even the longer range models, like this is out over the next 45 days, continues to be aggressively dry in that same area. So get yourself oriented. Here's the Black Sea. There's the Northern Caucasus. That's Georgia. This would be um, Southern Russian wheat belt. And there's Ukraine. So just take note that the models are going over dry and staying dry in that area uh, for much of the next uh, month to month and a half, and possibly even longer than that. I pulled up the new European seasonal data. We'll get new data tomorrow night, meaning that in my Thursday morning video, I'll show you the new European model. But just take note that it's got that same region drier through the rest of summer. And why I'm concerned about this is I'm getting asked a lot of questions about 2010. 2010 was a very unique year in terms of ocean temperatures, primarily because this went very cold with a La Nina, yet we did not we, we, we did not see massive drought in the Midwestern United States. And part of the reason for that, because normally if you showed me this, I would just say major drought in the midsection of the country. 
A big reason for that was the placement of a large ridge of high pressure in the southeastern United States. So what this ended up doing was taking the Pacific high, which I worry about being here, pushed it closer to the Pacific Northwest, which dropped a trough. It ran over this and it was extremely wet in the Midwest, just as one area to look at while the Southeast got extremely dry. Now that's I just totally switched geographies on you, but come over here now to this region. There was a huge ridge of high pressure that lived right here over those areas in Russia, which drove this region into exceptional drought while all of the colder air and better flow was much farther to the north where we're not growing a lot of crop this far north. And so the question becomes, is 2010 a potential analog to this year? Um, I don't think so, uh, based on where we currently are. So this is what our current ocean temperatures look like. So to get to 2010, that's 10 by July. This is June for 2024. Um, there are aspects of it that are similar, but I don't think we're fully pressing toward a 2010. Regardless, we can't ignore this. And there's many ways by which you can create a drought. And it's going to be important to watch the pattern across Europe to see if it does, in fact, deliver the risk of drought, not just here, but across parts of Ukraine or this part of southern Russia, the whole extent of it. Be paying attention to this in each of my videos as we address it going forward because it could become a very important story uh, at some point here. So I'll stop there. I'm going to head off to St. Louis. Got to give a talk this afternoon. Be back tonight, and I'll see you all again tomorrow morning. Thanks.